Chapter 10 Seeing me take off, Bitsy leaped down from her place on the porch, hobble-bobbling next to me like she intended to come along. Go back, I said, shooing her away. You're not fast enough, girl. Go back to Grandpa. When I reached the ranch's entrance sign by the highway, I stopped to catch my breath, struggling to adjust to the thinner, drier Wyoming air after sprinting up and over the south ridge full throttle. The sign over my head was a towering 10-gauge steel construction with the name of the ranch and the hand-cut figure of a butterfly with upside-down, heart-shaped spots. The Montezuma's Cattle Heart The butterfly Autry had been following in Mexico when he met the twins' mom. The heavy sign shivered over my head. Moving away from it, I turned east, following the road, telling myself I'd turn around before I reached Sundance. I settled into a lung-pushing, blood-pulsing rhythm. The soles of my sneakers slapped the pavement, my arms pumped at my sides. Not wanting to cause an RV wreck or blow apart another bike, I stepped off the road whenever someone passed me. I tried to forget about the twins' play-acting, to forget what they'd said about my parents leaving me at the ranch for good. I didn't know how long I could live with Rocket and survive. The last two nights, I'd been forced to hit the hay up at a small, rammed earth house at the top of the East Ridge, with its thick, cement-like walls, sparse furnishings, and lack of electronic equipment or gadgets. Everyone agreed it was the safest place for me. Rocket and I had barely spoken as he set up a place for me to sleep after I wrecked the barn. Got what you need? He'd asked, tossing me a sleeping bag. Yeah, oof, I answered, getting the breath knocked out of me as I caught it. Toothbrush? I nodded. Need a pillow? I paused before nodding again, not wanting to seem too demanding. Rocket's final question came with a baleful look. Do you snore? All I could do was shrug and repeat over and over inside my head, Don't snore, Ledge. Don't snore. As Rocket disappeared to grab a pillow, I glanced carefully around the room. He'd taped maps and pictures of motorcycles to every wall, and stacked travel magazines and books about adventure on every surface. There were photographs, too. Pictures of family and people I didn't recognize. Rocket may not have left the ranch in years, but he obviously dreamed about it. Shaking out the sleeping bag, I accidentally knocked down a bunch of his photos. I'd rushed to pick them up and stick them back on the wall, but one kept slipping down, a photo of a much younger Rocket, holding hands with some girl. The girl was tall, with blonde hair, long bangs, and a pink gum bubble the size of a grapefruit hiding half her face. If I hadn't been afraid Rocket would light me up like an x-ray skeleton, I might have asked for tape to rehang the picture, but I'd been pretty sure it would have been safer to ask an angry grizzly bear to dance. Autry might, have not, might not have stopped me from running from the flying cattle heart, but I soon realized he hadn't let me go alone. A tight group of cobalt dragonflies zipped beside me like a squadron of blue angels, executing coordinated loops and rolls. The insects jetted so close I could feel the vibration of their wings against my skin. Halfway between my uncle's ranch and town, I stopped. On the south side of the road, a salvage yard sprawled beyond a low hill, nearly hidden by a stand of dark pines. The sign for Nary's Auto Salvage Acres was overshadowed by a foreclosure notice, just like the ones I'd seen in town. It seemed as though the people in these parts were having trouble making the payments on their loans, but I knew times were tough all over. Looking between the trees at the sea of crumpled cars and trucks, I wondered if a junkyard would be the best spot in the world for me, or the worst. Was I looking at my life to come? I shook my head and picked up my pace. Sweat soaked and parched, I reached the town of Sundance 20 minutes after I left the ranch. Ignoring the inner voice hollering at me to turn around, I made one last push past the heavy equipment yard of a building whose sign read, Cad Co., Kabat Acquisition, Acquisitions and Demolitions. The name of the, on the sign made me think of Sarah Jane. In a town the size of Sundance, there couldn't be too many Kabats. When I reached the Welcome to Sundance sign, I stopped, 
My mind still full of Sarah Jane Cabot. Cars moved along... Is that I-90 or 190? All right. I-90 in the hills, in the distance, and a low mountain rose up above the rolling hills. Autry's dragonflies landed near my feet, taking up resting positions along the white line on the pavement. Tiny aircraft queued up on a four-inch wide runaway. Pacing beneath the sign, I pulled the Sundance scuttlebutt notebook from my pocket. Unable to sleep, I'd glanced at some of Sarah Jane's crazy notes the night before. The girl had a way with words. That was solid. In the dead of night, I believed every one of them, until the light of morning came and common sense returned. It was hard to stay convinced for long that Sundance was being overrun by axe handle hounds, small dogs that ate the handles off unintended axes, or that there was a race of tiny people who lived in the stacks at Crook County Public Library coming out at night to shelve books for the librarians. I slapped the notebook against my palm, still pacing beneath the Welcome to Sundance sign. She'd written her name and address on the paperboard cover. The longer I paced, the looser the bolts holding the sign to its post became, until the sign lurched, swinging like a pendulum from a single remaining bolt. I stopped and stared again at Sarah Jane's address, realizing that I might be able to use the notebook as leverage. Maybe Sarah Jane would want her notebook bad, badly, back badly enough to make a trade. I knew if I could just get Grandma Dollop's jar, I'd feel a whole lot better. It would be easier to learn to scumble my savvy if I didn't have that Shanghai jar lingering cruelly on my conscience. Fifteen minutes later, I found myself on the front porch of the Kabat residence. After getting directions from someone on the street, it had taken a while. The town was as quiet as it had been two days before, and the few people I ran into hadn't been eager to tell me how to find the Kabats. The house was a hulking Victorian structure that sat alone above the town, surrounded by dozens of stumps and one tall birch tree. It looked like a maniac logger had hit the place overnight and had been chased away by axe-handle hounds before he could cut down the last tree. The remaining paper-white birch bent over the house, its branches hugging the place like pale arms. A spiked wrought iron fence encircled the entire property. Cautiously, I moved through the gate, climbed the stairs to the porch, and reached for the door knocker, hoping that nothing would fall apart. Sweat dripped from my hair, stinging my eyes. Autry's dragonflies pestered me. When the Kabat's housekeeper opened the door, I took a step back. Standing in the doorway, the frizzy-haired, bug-eyed woman clutched the handle of a carpet sweeper in one hand and a glossy, rolled-up supermarket tabloid in the other, a headline about UFOs barely visible between her fingers. Whether it was the rolled-up paper that motivated them or something else, Autry's dragonflies gave up their bully ragging and struck off in a blue streak. Without, without blinking, the housekeeper raised her eyebrows a fraction of an inch, indicating quite clearly and with the smallest possible effort, that I should speak quickly, quickly or get my little doggies yippee tie yo gone. That's weird. <laughs> um, did Sarah Jane get back okay the other night? I asked, my words tripping over themselves, as if Mom were standing over my shoulder telling me to be quick. I mean, is Sarah Jane here? Can I see her? I held my breath, watching out of the corner of my eye, as the screws that held the door knocker in place began to work their way loose. A full ten seconds passed while the housekeeper stared at me blankly. My request to see Sarah Jane appeared to have left her baffled. Are you a friend of Miss Cabot's? she asked, and the way she said the word friend made me guess I was the first kid to come around knocking in quite some time. Maybe Sarah Jane had been telling the truth when she'd told me she had no friends. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay, I answered, rubbing the faint bruise that shaded my chin like a smudge of newsprint. A souvenir from my last encounter with the intrepid Sarah Jane in her friendly, friendly fist. I held up Sarah Jane's notebook. See, I've got her notebook right here. Trust me, SJ and I go way back. All the way back to Saturday. The housekeeper stepped back, nodding me into the house with a point of her chin. I'm cleaning, she said gruffly, rattling the carpet sweeper in my face.
You can wait in Mr. Kabat's study while I call Miss Kabat down. Mr. Kabat's not here, and I always save his room for last. She turned a sharp eye on me, rimpling her nose like she smelled something bad, then added, If you value your skin, don't touch anything, or Mr. Kabat might make you part of his collection. His collection? The woman didn't elaborate. She didn't have to. Kabat's study spoke volumes for itself, and I didn't think I liked what it had to say.